Here in the Everglades, as in all ecosystems, every living thing is linked together to form a very complex community. Everything is connected in some way. In order to grow and survive, there are two things that every organism needs, matter and energy. But where do these things come from? And how do they pass from one living thing to another? This process, the flow of energy and matter through a community, is most easily understood by constructing a simple illustration we call a food chain. Today we'll construct a typical Everglades food chain. But the story really starts about 93 million miles from South Florida. The sun is like an enormous nuclear reactor, radiating its rays across the solar system. Without the sun's energy, there would be no life on Earth. Without the sun, there would be no plants the first link in our chain of life. Green plants, as well as cyanobacteria and certain types of algae, are able to harness the energy of the sun, converting it to food energy in the form of sugary compounds. We call these organisms producers, and this is where our food chain begins. The Everglades are full of producers, from sawgrass to mangroves. One very important producer is a slimy goo called paraphyton. Paraphyton is complicated stuff, but it's basically a mixture of different types of algae. It can be found covering the limestone floor and many of the submerged plants of the Everglades. The second link of our food chain is occupied by what we call a primary consumer. This is an herbivore, or a plant eater. For our chain, we'll use the mosquito larva. In its larval form, the mosquito is an aquatic herbivore, swimming around munching on organic matter. It loves paraphyton. The gambusia, on the other hand, loves mosquito larvae. This is why we also call him the mosquito fish. We'll stick him in the third link of our food chain. The gambusia is what we call a secondary consumer. Secondary consumers are animals that eat primary consumers. Because the gambusia mostly eats other animals, he can be classified as a carnivore. The great blue heron is a fish eater. He has a dagger-like bill designed for spearing and snatching swimming prey. The heron is able to nab some pretty big fish, but the gambusia makes a nice appetizer. Because he mostly eats secondary consumers, this makes the great blue heron a tertiary consumer and gives him a spot on our fourth link. Now for the big guy. The American alligator is a formidable beast. As a fully grown adult, he's way at the top of the food chain. He's what we call a top predator, also known as an apex predator. For the gator, an unobservant great blue heron would be gourmet dining. This guy is aware of the danger. Time to go sunbathe elsewhere. When we construct a food chain, we notice that there are usually no more than about four or five links from producer to top predator. There's a good reason for this. When one organism eats another organism, it uses up a lot of the food energy that is taken in instead of passing all of it up to the next link in the chain. Much of that energy is used in digestion and other metabolic processes as the organism grows and passes out into the environment as heat energy. At the same time, a lot of the matter is excreted as waste and is incorporated into the soil. In fact, the rule of thumb is that only about 10% of the energy that is consumed by an organism passes on to the next level. This is called the 10% rule. So basically, there can't be too many links in the chain or the predators at the top of the food chain won't be able to get enough food energy to grow and survive.